great math. Today we are going to discuss about the events of compound probability. My name is Mr. Gina Dressel and I am your teacher. So the highly proficient student can compare different situations to determine the best prediction. This is the standard of um, this lesson for today. So specifically for today we will calculate the number of outcomes of compound event and I will determine if events are independent dependent or mutually exclusive I will calculate compound probability and for the, the end by the end of this lesson we are able to answer that question what is compound probability and how is it calculated so the events of compound probability there are three major things we call the events or compound probability of compound events so they are independent dependent and mutually exclusive and we are going to discuss each of them and give you examples as to how are we going to calculate the probability of each of these kind of events. So let's start with independent events. To define that, um, let's say whatever happens in one event has absolutely nothing to do with that, with what will happen next because the two events are unrelated. So by from the word independent, they can stand by themselves and whatever happens to that event it does not affect the other also you can also um, say this like when you repeat an event with an item whose numbers will not change so for example the spinners or dice even if you will repeat spinning the, the spinner hundred times the number of um, probabilities will not change or when you roll the dice a hundred times there will always be six faces in the dice so that will never change or when you repeat the same activity but you replace the item that was removed so for example when you are taking um, jelly beans from a bag and after each time you uh, take a jelly bean out you replace it with another thing so this there will be the same number of jelly beans in the bag so that is what we call independent events so how to find the probability of independent events? The probability of two independent events, A and B, is equal to the probability of event A times the probability of event B. So this is how we are going to write that. The probability of event A and um, the probability of event B is equal to the probability of event A times the probability of event B. These two probabilities are independent, two independent, independent events. So A and B is equal to A times B. I, let me give you a specific example for that one. So example, suppose you spin each of these two spinners. What is the probability of spinning an, an even number and a vowel? So, the two spinners are two different things. So, one is numbers, the other one has letters in it. So, the probability of getting an even number with these spinners, with numbers 1 through 6, is 1 half because there are 3 events out of 6 outcomes. The even numbers are the 2, the 4, and the 6. Those are the even numbers. In the other spinner, you are asked as to what is the probability of getting a vowel letter so that is one out of five because if you look at the letters there's only one and this spinner is divided into five parts so there's only one vowel out of five outcomes so what is the probability of getting an even number in the first spinner and getting also a vowel on the other spinner so that must happen the same um, at the same time an even number here and a vowel on the other on the other spinner. So just multiply the probability of getting even numbers, which is one half, times the probability of getting a vowel um, sound or a vowel letter in the other spinner, and that is one half times one point five. When you multiply fractions, you simply just multiply the numbers across. I'm sorry for that. Just multiply the numbers across. So that is one times one equals 1 and 2 times 5 equals 10 so that is 
how you multiply fractions. So therefore, final answer is the probability of getting an even number in a vowel on the other spinner is 1 out of 10. So if you will repeat that one 10 times, what does it mean? So if you repeat that one 10 times, there is a tendency that you will get one chance of getting a, an even number here and a vowel letter in this one. So let's say the arrow is here and the arrow is here. So that will happen only once out of 10 tries. That's the um, theoretical probability for that. All right? So next, what if we have this example? Find the probability of getting a jack in the deck of cards in a factor of 12. So if you look, look at the cards, there, there are only five cards here, five hearts. All of them are hearts. I love hearts. So, and the other uh, uh, thing is the spinner, in which there are eight numbers. So, factor of 12. So when you say factors of 12, those are the numbers that you, um, if you will multiply them, it makes 12. So, factors of 12, 1, because 12 can be divided by 1. It can be 2, because 2 times 6 is 12. It can be um, 3, because 3 times 4 is 12. It can be 4, because 4 times 3 is 12. 5 is not. 6 is. And... That's it, because you only have up to 8. 7 is not, and 8 is not. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's why you get that 5 in there. And 8 is the total possible outcomes, because there are 8 numbers here. Okay, So that is how you get the 5 out of 8. So what is the probability of getting a jack here in a factor of 12 on the other side? So just simply multiply straight across. 1 times 5 is 5. And 5 times 8 is 40. So look at the, the fraction. 5 over 40. That can still be further simplified. How? Just simply divide this. Or just find the least common denominator. Uh, I mean multiple. I mean greatest common multiple between the two numbers. And that is 5. So divide both numbers by the greatest common multiple. And that is 5. 5. So 5 divided by 5 is 1, and 40 divided by 5 is 8. Therefore, your final answer is 1 out of 8. So therefore, if you will do the same thing, like pick a random card here and spin the spinner, out of 8 tries, there is one chance of getting a jack and getting a factor of 12. Okay? Does it make it clear? Alright, hopefully you get that one. So now, Let's proceed to, let me erase that one first so that when we go back there, that will not anymore pop up. Okay, so next is this last practice for independent events. Find the probability of getting a 6 on the first die and not 5 on the other die. So remember that this is called independent events because whatever happens in the other uh, event does not affect the other event because both of them can stand by themselves and they are called independent. So now, let's have this. Getting a 6 from this dice is only 1 out of 6. And getting not 5, not 5 on this dice has 5 out of 6 because there's only one 5 in there. So you can have 1, you can have 2, 3, 4, and 6. So you can have 5 chances of getting not 5 here. So the getting if 6 and not 5 will give you 1 out of 6 times 5 out of 6. 1 times 5 is 5. Just multiply straight across. And what? I'm sorry, that is? That looks weird. That 5 looks weird. Okay. Let me do that again. So that's 5 here. And 6 times 6 is 36. Is there a com greatest common? Um, multiple of 5 and 36? No. So that will be your final answer. So the probability of getting a 6 in, in the first die and not a 5 in the other die, you will get 
5 times out of 36 tries. That's the theoretical probability for that. Okay? Right. So what about the two other types of um, events in compound probability? So let's go to dependent events. What happens during the second event depends upon what happened before. So that means the second event is affected by what happened in the first event. In other words, the result of the second event will change because of what happened first. Let's take an example. How to find the probability of dependent events. The probability of two dependent events A and B is equal to the probability of event A times the probability of event B. However, the probability of event B now depends on event A. So the same way of finding the probability of events, but this time the probability of event B depends on what happened on the probability uh, on the um, event A. So there's a little change in that one, but the same process, just multiply them. Let's take this example. What is the probability of drawing two aces? without replacing the first card. So if you will take, if you will draw two aces at a time, then that means uh, it, in the first event, if you'll take two aces and you will not replace it, that means in the second event, there will be only one, I mean two, uh, three aces left because you did not replace the A. So that means what's the probability of getting an A in the first try, in the first event? Because there are four aces at, at the beginning, so you have four out of 52 chances. In the second event, since you did not replace, you, you did not replace the A that is being taken away, so that means there are only three aces left in the deck of cards. So your probability is now 3 out of 51. Why 51? Because remember, you take away 1A. And that A has changed from 4 into 3. And the total number of cards in the deck is now 51 because you took away the first A. So what is now the probability? 4 times 3 is 12. And 52 times 51 is 2,652. Therefore, this is your chance. That is the probability of getting two aces, um, I mean, consecutively in a pile of, uh, in a deck of cards. So, out of 2,652 tries, you will only get 12 um, chances. But remember that you can actually um, reduce this one. So how do you reduce that? Let's say 6 divided by 2 and then 1,326. 1, Can you still further reduce this one? I think so. So that means 3. 1,300 is 650. And there's 26, so there's 600, 650, 663. Okay, and maybe you can further reduce the one, but let's settle down for there because we still have a lot of things to discuss here. So the third one is, I mean, before that, we'll, we'll have an example that we will do. So find the probability of this dependent events. What is the probability of getting a Q and then another Q if all the letters of the alphabet are placed in the bag one time and you do not replace the letter? Okay, so at first, since there are 26 letters in the alphabet, there must be 26 chances, sorry, there must be 26 um, things inside the bag, so that is your total number of outcomes. And there's one, only one Q in there. So therefore, when you get a Q, that is one out of 26. That's your first chance. Your second chance is since you took the Q out, if you happen to get the Q in the first try, 
and you do not replace them. Therefore, there's nothing, uh, there's no more Q left inside the bag. So that's 0 out of 25. So that means if you will multiply that 1 out of times 0 is 0, and 26 times 25 is, let's say, what is 26 times 25? Um, 20 times 20, 26 times 25 is uh, 650. Am I correct? No, I think 26 times 25. Yeah, it's 650. 650. Now, 0 divided by 650. 0 divided by 650. Sorry for that. I, I, I forgot to delete this. Zero. There we go. Zero divided by 650 is zero. So therefore, the probability of getting two Qs in a consecutive manner from the bag of um, alphabet, wherein there's only one Q in a set of alphabet, actually. So there is no chance for you to get two Qs. Does it make sense? So, therefore, your chances of getting two Qs is zero because there are, there's only one Q in the set of alphabet. Now, let's proceed to the third example. So, there are six black pens and eight blue pens in a jar. If you take a pen without looking and then take another pen without replacing the, the first, what is the probability that you will get two black pens? Remember, there are six black pens at first. So that is your six there. And there are eight blue pens in the jar. So the six plus eight is 14. So there are 14 total pens inside the jar. Or if you will reduce this one, this is three out of seven. That's your first probability. The second probability of getting a black in the second in the second um, try or second attempt is only five because there's only five black pens left because you did not replace it. So the total number of pens inside the um, jar is also changed from 14 into 13. So your second chance is five out of 13. There are 13 pens left and five are black. So therefore, the chance of getting a black pen in the first attempt and another black pen in the second attempt is 3 over 7 times 5 over 13 or if you multiply 3 times 5 that is 15 and 7 times 3 is 91 therefore your chance of getting two black pens in a consecutive manner is 15 over 91 okay All right so let's give this a try. I will not make it hard for you, but let's just try to identify whether is this dependent or independent events. Tossing two dice and getting a six on both of them. Dependent or independent? This is independent because what happens in the first try, the dice will not change. It will also be the same thing. It's still six sides. You have a bag of marbles, three blue, five white, and 12 red. You choose one marble out of the bag. Look at it, then put it back. Remember, put it back. So the numbers of blue or white or red does not change, in, or even the total number of um, marbles inside the bag does not change. Then you choose another marble. So is that dependent or independent? That is independent. Third example, you have a basket of socks. You need to find the probability of pulling out a black sock and it's matching black sock without putting the first sock back. Of course, this is a big clue for you. If you will not put back the first thing, the total number of socks in the basket will change. Therefore, this is dependent because what happens in the second event depends on what you, you do, what did you do in the first event. Fourth example, you pick the letter Q from a bag containing all the letters of the alphabet. 
you do not put the cube back in the bag before you pick another tile. Is that probability? Uh, is that dependent or independent event? Of course, this is dependent because if you will take the cube out from the bag and you do not put the cube back, therefore that is dependent. So how easy is that? Isn't it so um, simple? It's just so easy. All you have to do is just to look for the guiding words, like putting it back or not, or um, other situations like that. Okay? Now, let's proceed. The third type of event is the mutually exclusive event. So, events that cannot occur at the same time, or, uh, for example, rolling two or a four. You cannot have, if you have only one die, you can roll two and a four at the same time. Or selecting a hamburger or pizza, you cannot, maybe your dad will not allow you to, to um, buy both. But you only have to choose between a hamburger or a pizza for your lunch. Or going to a concert or a movie. Are you going to the concert or go to the movie? You cannot divide yourself. Like half of you will go to the concert and half of you will go to the movie. So that thing cannot occur at the same time. So that's what we call mutually exclusive event. Okay? So now... How to find the probability of mutually exclusive event? The probability of two mutually exclusive events, events A and B, is equal to the probability of event A plus, take note of the word plus. So, sorry, in the first two types of events, you are multiplying them, but here, you just simply add them. The probability of getting an uh, event A and event B in a mutually exclusive event is just adding the probability of A and the probability of B because they cannot happen at the same time. So let's take this example. Alfred is going to the Lakeshore Animals Shelter to pick a new pet. A new pet, that means the word A there means only one. So the Today, the shelter has eight dogs, seven cats, and five rabbits, rabbits available for adoption. If Alfred randomly pick an animal, an animal that means only one, to adopt, what is the probability that the animal would be a cat or a dog? A cat or a dog. Okay, so now, how many animals are in there? Eight plus seven is 15 plus five is, a fifth is 20. So the total possible outcome is 20. And how many dogs or cats are in there? There are only 15. But he cannot choose both. Only one of them. So 15 over 20 can be reduced as 3 out of 4. Okay. So that is the probability of getting a, a dog or a cat. Does it make sense? Because the probability of getting a dog is 8 out of 20. Well, the probability of getting a cat is 7 out of 20. That's why, since you have both 20 as the denominator, so you don't have to find the common denominator, but simply add the numerators. 8 plus 7 equals 15. That's how you get the 15 in there. All right, so last example. The French club has 16 seniors, 12 juniors, 15 sophomores, and 21 freshmen as members. What is the probability that a member chosen at random is a junior or a senior? But that cannot be because you are only choosing a, a member, so that means you will only need to choose one but what is the probability of getting a junior or a senior? Okay, so I'll give you a tip. To easily identify whether it's mutually exclusive event, just find for the word or. If you can see the word or, then that is a mutually exclusive event. But it, have, it depends on the situation, not all the time. So that's why you have to read this question um, well. But that is a very obvious indication in there. Most of the time, there's always an or in there. So the probability of getting a junior is 12 out of the 64 friend, uh, members in the French club, while the probability of getting a senior is also 60, uh, has 16 because there are 16 seniors in there 
out of 64 members. So if you will add them, so since it has the same common denominator, you, you only have to copy that common denominator and add the two numerators. Therefore, that's 28. 12 plus 16 is 28. And 28 over 64 can be reduced by dividing both by 4. Divide by 4, divide by 4. Because 4 is the greatest common factor between them. So, um, 28 divided by 4 is 7, and 64 divided by 4 is 16. Therefore, your final answer is 7 over 16. Okay? Do you have any other question? Right. So, if you have questions, feel free to leave a comment or send me a message. Now, let's have this. Test yourself. A coin is flipped in a spinner with a four sections labeled 1, 2, 3, 4 at the same time. Make an organized list of sample space. Um, we can skip that organized space, but um, let's just, just go to the next question. Identify the probability of getting an outcome that includes three or four on the spinner. I know that this is a mutually exclusive event because of this word four, but spinning a single spinner cannot happen to be both three and four. So I should um, consider this as a mutually exclusive so getting a 3, in, divided into 3 sections, getting a 3 is 1 out of, sorry, that's 1 out of 4. And getting a 4 is also 1 out of 4. So the probability of getting a 3 or 4 is 2 out of 4. Or in simple, uh, simplified term, it's 1 half. So there is 1 out of 2 chances of getting a 3 or a 4 in a speed does it make sense? All right, so I hope this um, this video helps a lot for you, and that's going to be the end of our uh, today's lesson about events of compound probability. Thank you, and have a great rest of your day.